Beyonce. Okay, it's on. Great. Okay, hello everyone. I mean, hasn't this been an amazing conference? I feel so privileged to be able to share the stage with so many amazing speakers. Now, I've recently been in London properly for the first time about a month ago. Because honestly, I thought I'd been to London before. I mean, I'd gone through Heathrow so many times. I could tell you exactly where the toilets were. This is where you charge your stuff until somebody pointed out. You know, that's not exactly having been to London, you know? <laughs> but anyway, as I was introduced, my name is Hui Jing. I'm actually from Malaysia. I used to play basketball full time, kickstarted my work career. I absolutely adore CSS, and I will write blog posts about CSS, amongst other things. And I'm also a Mozilla tech speaker, and, which is an initiative by Mozilla to support technical evangelists in regional communities around the world by providing resources and funding. So you heard from some of my fellow tech speakers earlier today, and if you're interested, applications for the winter cohort are now open. So. Sorry, I said this. The reason that I visited London properly for the first time was that I got a new job, now a developer advocate at Nexmo. This word has been mentioned a bit. Out of curiosity, has anybody even heard of Nexmo? Yeah. Yes, yes. I've had to explain this to some of my friends back home, like, yeah, Nexmo. Okay, so what Nexmo does is it's a platform, makes it easier for developers to integrate communications into their applications because we provide APIs, for messaging, voice, and authentication. If this is something that might be useful to you, you could come up and chat with me or Alex, who hosted the amazing lightning talk section earlier. But that's too much about me. Now, we're going to talk about Bruce Lee. Now, I see some skeptical faces, though. Like, some of you might be thinking, wait, wait, what does Bruce Lee have to do with web design? Maybe some of you don't even know who Bruce Lee is. Hmm. Well, Bruce Lee, in my opinion, was the most impactful martial artist of this generation. And his legendary fighting prowess translated really well on the silver screen. He became an iconic kung fu superstar, but he was also a deeply self-reflective man who developed prof profound philosophical insights about the world around him and life itself. Now, Bruce Lee was a student of both Western and Eastern philosophy and drew inspiration from the Taoist principles by Lao Tzu, recorded in the Chinese classic Tao Te Ching, which is a remarkably timeless publication given that it was authored in the 4th century BC. Now, water is a key metaphor in Taoist philosophy, and it can also be applied to the web. Content on the web behaves just like water. Now, rather than trying to wrangle every pixel into place, we need to embrace the fact that content is meant to flow. When you freeze water into ice, it can no longer flow into containers of different shapes and sizes. Content that is fixed can only look good on specific devices. Also, if I throw a ball of ice at you, it's going to hurt. Now, designing for the web requires an intimate knowledge of the browser that will be rendering our final output. We can't just stick our hands in there and change things directly. Instead, we have to modify the instructions that we give to the browser, explaining how we would like things to be rendered. If you paid attention during Mariko's talk earlier today, you'd have realized that the web has changed and evolved over the past three decades, as have I. <laughs> Now, I wasn't very useful in my early days. I couldn't walk. I couldn't understand most instructions. I did whatever I felt like doing, sort of how browsers were back in the day, I think. But as the years passed, browser capabilities advanced. And mine did, too. Now, I can now, I developed the ability to run. I can throw a ball. I can even drive a car. I'm very proud of myself. I could also now understand much more complicated instructions than before. And what modern CSS gives us is a wider vocabulary with which to communicate with the browser. Bootstrap is arguably the most popular front end framework around, originally started as a framework to encourage consistency across internal tools within Twitter. When its creators released it as an open source project in 2011, it really took off. It wasn't long before other frameworks started to pop up as well. And what frameworks offer are a set of pre-written styles that developers can use to build up apps or sites by applying the relevant CSS classes. Now, these frameworks provide consistent options for things like layouts, 
uh, UI elements, interactions, etc. Consistent, but limited. Now, frameworks themselves are not a problem. It's a great concept, but only if the framework is built and developed to cater to the requirements of the project in question. There may be a number of use cases for adopting an off-the-shelf framework, but if we choose to learn a framework and learn it well, then all we get is the ability to maneuver within the bounds of the framework. And in this day and age, browsers are cons constantly being updated with new features and bug fixes. The web is ever-changing, at odds with the fixed patterns of frameworks. So I think we need a new normal for the web. A normal where people don't expect websites to look exactly the same in different browsers and devices. A normal where we embrace the fluidity, which Mandy already said, I'm going to reiterate this throughout the talk, where we embrace the fluidity of content and work with it instead of against it. A normal where we cede control of our designs to the browsers that render them. Now, people access information predominantly through browsers, and mm, boy, do we have a lot of them. And all these browsers are powered largely by four major layout engines. We have WebKit by Apple, uh, Blink by Google, which is a fork of WebKit, Gecko by Mozilla, H HTML by Microsoft. And with the maturation of web standards, browser behavior is less unpredictable than before. I mean, things aren't perfect. Features aren't all supported at the same time. Sometimes they're browser-specific bugs. But you know what? That's, that's perfectly fine. If we accept this as a feature of the web instead of a bug, we've opened ourselves up to a lot more web design possibilities. Now, feature queries are key to making such an approach feasible. What they do is provide CSS feature detection using native CSS. Support for feature queries is really good, with coverage in over 90% of browsers, even Opera Mini. The only browsers that don't support it are Internet Explorer and BlackBerry Mobile, and that actually isn't too big of an issue. I'll explain a bit later. So this is how a feature query would look like, because it's a conditional that checks if the browser supports a particular property or not. If it doesn't, the entire block within the at supports rule is ignored. So this means we start off with a basic layout, works everywhere. It could be float-based layout, single column, largely browser default UI styles and that sort of thing. And then we layer on styles based on the features that we want to use. So by organizing our code in this manner, both browsers that do not support feature queries or the specified properties will still get styled, albeit a bit more basic of a style, right? But the newer browsers, they will get enhanced layouts if they support some or all of the newer features within each feature query. So this is a website that utilizes such an approach. We have a basic single column layout that serves as the baseline experience. And for browsers that support newer features, certain components will have an enhanced layout. The browser in the middle has grid support, but not shapes, while the one on the right supports both. But all three layouts work off the same code base. So if any browser starts supporting a newer feature, you don't have to go back and update your code. Your design updates itself. Now, such an approach does require a level of familiarity with CSS, it's not, but it's not rocket science. It boils down, really, to experience and the willingness to understand and embrace CSS for what it is. Now, even though layout is a pretty big part of web design, it is interesting to note that when CSS was first introduced, it wasn't meant for doing layout. But fast forward to today, we are at a point where we can almost match what is possible in print. However, we do need to keep in mind that the web is a different medium from print. Exactly like Mandy said, just like there are things that print can do that web can't, there are numerous things that the web can do that print cannot. And often with CSS, there are multiple ways to achieve the same effect. However, the amount of effort required depends on whether we choose the right tool for the job. So CSS Transforms is one such tool. Although we tend to associate transforms with animations, there's also a case to be made for static transforms, especially when it comes to layout design. 
Now, diagonals are a very dynamic visual direction, and when used in layout design, create an active composition that imply movement or depth, and such art direction is totally possible on the web. If you're familiar with image editing software like Photoshop, you'll see that a lot of image manipulation techniques can now be done in CSS as well. So these are four basic transformations for the 2D space, and they can be used for 3D transforms as well. So this here was based off the header graphic on a CSS Tricks article called The Critical Request. Now, I thought it was beautifully designed, and upon further inspection, I realized it was an image. But this image can totally be recreated in CSS, allowing it to morph depending on the context in which it is viewed. So on a narrow screen, it's probably not feasible to use diagonals given the limited space, but on a wider layout, it turns out pretty well. For browsers that do not support transforms, we can still present a layout that doesn't use these properties with the help of feature queries. Things get a lot more interesting when we're not fixated by, on making things look exactly the same all the time. 3D transforms also make for great visual impact, and the benefit of doing it with text plus CSS is it provides much better accessibility than sticking the text in an image. With 3D transforms, we are operating on more than one axis, which is the z-axis for depth. So there are additional properties like back face visibility and perspective, for example. And the perspective property controls how far an element appears to recede into the horizon. So the smaller the value, the more dramatic the 3D effect is. So if I modify the value here, you'll see that it changes and it just sort of recedes much further away. Support for transforms is really good for 2D and 3D transforms, but you don't have to use them if they don't fit your project. It's just good to know that this option exists when you do need it. Now, magazine layouts. These are chock full of interesting text flow shapes. And maybe we see this a bit more in fashion magazines, but shaped text is not exclusive to such publications. This one is from Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, we have one newspaper sometimes to do it. Generally, the idea is to let text flow around something so it's not laid out in a rectangular shape all the time. The CSS module that allows us to do this is called CSS Shapes. Now, for now, we can only let text flow around shapes and images with the shape outside property. And when you apply this property to a floated element, a text will flow on the opposite side of the shape in question. Now, there are four basic shape functions we can use to define the outline around which we want the text to flow. We've got We've got circle, we've got ellipse, we've got inset, and we've got polygon. And these same functions are also used in the clip path property. So if you can see in this polygon example, both properties actually share the same value. Firefox strips support for shapes in 62, and it comes with a really nifty shapes editor that allows us to see and edit shapes created by shape path, as well as basic shapes from the shape outside property. So if you inspect an element that uses clip path or shapes, you should be able to see an icon next to the shape function, and you can toggle the editor, which you can then manipulate in the browser to see the values update. Now, my personal favorite is shapes from images, because somehow seeing text flow around an image makes me happy. Now, the image has to have transparency, because the alpha channel is used to compute the shape, and pixels which fall below this property called the shape image threshold, they are ignored, so text can flow into that area instead. Okay. The only browser holdout at the moment is Edge. But the property is under consideration, so I encourage all of you to help out by voting for this feature. I myself has already tossed in three votes for this feature, so the more the merrier, please. Thank you. And another aspect of layout that we are close to matching in the digital world is the ability to typeset writing systems other than that, that other than those which flow horizontally from top to bottom. So like Arabic and Hebrew scripts. These are read from right to left. We also have East Asian scripts, like Chinese and Japanese, that can be written both horizontally and vertically. And the writing mode property allows us to cater for vertical writing on the web via CSS. Like I mentioned, vertical writing is traditionally East Asian for Han characters like Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, where the inline direction is from top to bottom, and the text is read from right to left. But you don't have to miss out on the fun just because you don't design for these languages. 
Vertical text has been part of print design for the longest time, and it's about time that the web got in on it as well. This example demonstrates the writing mode properties different values. So we have vertical RL and LR, and we can even combine writing mode with other properties like transforms. It is also possible to control the orientation of individual characters with the text orientation properties. So if like, for example, if I set this to upright, you can see that the characters change their orientation. So how can we use something like this in the context of a horizontal writing system like most of us are used to today? Well, one idea is for headers. I mean, it might not be the best idea to lay out long chunks of text vertically because it just makes things hard to read. But using vertical text for short titles and headers can break up the monotony, especially on a long scrolling page. And there are a number of small components which we can subtly sneak in some vertical text without affecting the user's reading experience. Things like tags on blog posts where information is not critical to the main content. Stripe's online publication increment chose to use vertical text on its menu links on a landscape view. But once the viewport grows narrow, they morph back to a horizontal layout. Just why we have media queries, right? Also, depending on the number of links on your navigation menu, perhaps a vertical layout on a narrow screen could be a design choice worth considering. Today's CSS really gives us a lot more creative choices as compared to when responsive design first became a thing in 2010. But a major evolution in web layout is the ability to position and align content in both the inline and block directions. Alignment along the inline axis was generally well supported from the start, especially for languages that were read horizontally from top to bottom. Moving text or blocks of content horizontally wasn't too complicated. You know, we had text align. We could use auto margins to move blocks, center them. But vertical alignment required a lot of workarounds, a lot of hacks, a lot of frustration. Luckily, CSS is not a fixed technology. Changes were introduced, improvements were made, and now we have a suite of tools for two-dimensional layout and alignment. Flexbox, short for flexible box. It was conceived as a powerful tool for distributing space and aligning content in ways that web apps and complex websites often need. This is quoted from the specification. Now, when people complain that Flexbox doesn't make sense, that their items are not sized the way they want, they are fighting against the flexible nature of items in a flex formatting context. Because flex formatting context can operate in both dimensions now, the auto margins technique makes centering components a lot less painful. Any positive free space will be distributed to auto margins in their respective dimensions. So if, for example, I set margin left to auto in this example, Boxy here gets ends up on the other end of the container. Or if I do something like margin top, I just send it all the way to the bottom. And if I don't specify a dimension, boom, centering. And I love showing this example to people who have just started out with CSS and like ran into a wall when they tried to center stuff. I'm like, eh, one line. <laughs> a common issue I hear is that it's difficult to create a grid system with Flexbox. Now, the thing about Flexbox is that even though you can make a grid system with it, it's not really the best tool for building a grid system. Items in a flex formatting context are aware of each other in a single dimension, either vertically or horizontally. But when flex items of equal width wrap to the next line, it may seem like we have rows and columns, but there is no relationship between flex items stacked on top of one another. Does that mean you cannot use Flexbox to lay out large, number, large numbers of items? Not at all. So here I have a list of images. And once I apply Display Flex to it, all the items are shrunk and laid out in a single row. I'm going to turn on Wrap. So they all revert to their original size and wrap down to the following row. If there's insufficient space in the current Flex line. I'm going to turn on a border so we can see what's going on with the flex items. There we go. So now let's, instead of the initial behavior of flex items of shrink but not grow, we're going to flip that around, turn that on. So let's make the images take up the width of its own container. OK. 
Okay, so we've got a starting point to play with alignment. I can do something like an align items center, create this sort of a jagged look, but maybe, you know, it's a bit messy, you want it a bit neater. We can do that. We can do that by standardizing the height of the children. So I'll do that. But oh, that kind of screws up the aspect ratio for some of the images, right? So we can compromise. We can use object fit to crop off the tops of the taller images. And you end up with something like this, right? I can also change the direction of the layout by setting a flex direction. I'll set it to column. We've got something like this. Give the container a height. And what we have now is this horizontal scrolling thing, which somehow we don't see very often on the web. And again, now we can play with alignment. And because I've changed the flex directions, the block and inline axes have also swapped. So now justify content moves things along the vertical axis and align items moves things along the horizontal axis. Okay. So again, we get this jagged thing but maybe this is too many gaps for some people's liking. That's fine, no, ma no problem. We can just remove all this alignment code and let ma let's make all the flex children totally flexible. And I could make the images fill up their containers heights. Here, calc is really useful because it allows me to account for the margins of each image with respect to their container heights. So let's standardize the width of all the items. And there, we get something like this. Remove the border. So such layouts are merely a demonstration of what Flexbox can do out the box. These are not hacks. These are not workarounds. These are native options that we have when it comes to designing layouts. Support for the auxiliary options of calc and object fit, pretty good lots of green, and they'll only continue to get better in the near future. So do feel free to experiment with them and see where they can fit in your project. But back to the topic of grids. When you want to build proper grids with rows and columns, then grid is the tool that we want to reach for. Grid, like Flexbox, is also really good at dealing with free space without us having to explicitly account for that free space. So grid introduces something known as the FR unit, which represents a fraction of free space in the grid container. Tracks sized using FR will adjust according to how much free space is left over and fill up available space accordingly. Now, a common use case that FR units can solve for are responsive uniform grids that need to adjust to the width of the viewport. For layout methods that revolve around the width of a grid item, like floats or inline block, Multiple media queries are often necessary because the width of each item has to be explicitly stated at each breakpoint. But with the FR unit, we cede control of the sizing of each grid item to the browser. And we allow the browser to figure out how large each grid item should be based on the parameters we provide through some new CSS functions that CSS grid provides. For example, we have minmax. This function allows us to do something we never could before, and that is to define a range of values. Now, I, now I can tell my browser that mm, I want grid columns or rows to be between a value of x and y, and then I let the browser figure out what that value should be. Also, if your design calls for a rather complex and large grid, you probably don't want to type out the tracks with by hand and repeat it again and again. You can use the repeat function which lets us repeat patterns of track sizes so we don't end up with ridiculously long lines of column or row sizes. The repeat function also takes in keywords, keywords of autofit and autofill. Now, both are very similar in that they tell the browser to generate the number of tracks required based on the track list specified as the second argument. Now, the minor difference is that for autofit, any empty tracks are collapsed. And this becomes more evident if you're using a flexible range for track sizing. So in this example, I've asked the browser to make me columns that are at least 150 pixels wide, but you can grow if free space permits. Currently, the keyword is set to autofill. So the available space can actually contain around eight columns. And even though I don't have enough grid items to fill up the last two columns, that space is still respected. It's still there. It takes up space. But if I change the value to auto fit, the columns that do contain grid items grow 
and fill up the empty space because the last two columns have now been collapsed. So let's put it all together. In this example, I'm telling the browser that when the viewport shrinks, cap the shrink of each column to 10 amps. If there's extra space, grow all the columns equally. By using autofill or maybe autofit, the browser will calculate how many columns fulfill these requirements. When the viewport size changes, the number of columns will increase or decrease until everything fits. And because the maximum size value is a flexible unit, if there is an excess of space, all the columns will grow equally to fill up that extra space. So there will never be any awkward white space on either side of the layout and you don't have to write a single media query to achieve this. One more thing I want to mention is the concept of an implicit grid. Now, the explicit grid is one we define using grid columns, uh, grid template columns and grid template rows, but there is nothing stopping us from placing an item outside the bounds of this grid that we defined. So what happens then? So we shall see. Here, I've defined a 3 by 2 grid. But there are more than six grid items, so the browser generates implicit rows and columns to hold these extra items. The explicit grid column lines only go up to four because there are three columns. So if I place something at line six, the browser generates three more implicit columns so that my item can be placed accordingly. So now these implicit columns will take up enough space to hold the item's content, but we can adjust the size of these using the grid auto properties. So if I do something like this, I can make the implicit, I can actually control the size of these implicit grid columns or rows. We also have a grid auto flow property, which lets us adjust the direction and density of grid items. Because when your layout consists of items of varying sizes, we end up with gaps in between them, and some of these are actually rather large gaps, right? So what we can do in this situation is that we can add a keyword called dense, which sort of packs into all these gaps any items that will fit. Yes, this sort of messes up the order, but you know, you get a much neater layout. And when it comes to direction, you can ch we can change this to not only row, but column as well. So this will take some adjusting. Values will change. Let's do this, let's do rows. And now we have this horizontal scrolling thing going on. Like, I'm pretty big on horizontal scrolling. And if we do the dense keyword, again, we can pack things together. And again, these are new features. We never could do this before, but now we have these in native CSS. You don't need extra libraries. This is something that the browser comes with. If you plan, to start exploring grid or already are using it, I highly suggest using Firefox for its excellent grid inspector. To toggle it, you click on the waffle-like icon next to display grid in your grid container element, and it will then show you all the grid lines. You can see where your grid items have been placed on the grid. Really helps with troubleshooting. We also get a layout panel, which provide additional customization options, like displaying grid line numbers, grid areas, as well as setting different colors if there are multiple grids on the same page. So we've covered quite a bit by now, but I hope I've shown how much CSS has evolved and how it calls for us to revisit some of the practices and mindsets that we've built up and solidified over the years. Bruce Lee had put forth a criticism of martial arts masters who build up an illusion of fixed forms, who attempt to solidify the ever-flowing. He called such practitioners insensitized, patternized robots who merely perform methodical routines as responses rather than responding to what is. It's a bit harsh, but it does make sense. Perhaps we too should allow our web designs to respond to what is. Perhaps we should be coming up with designs that listen to the circumstances of the different browsers that render them. Back in 1996, there were less than 100 properties in the first version of CSS. Today, 511 distinct CSS properties in the index, each serving a distinct purpose. There are properties for color, sizing, topography, layout, animation, visual effects, even sound. 
When we explore the myriad of potential combinations, the possibilities for the web are pretty endless. So here's a list of resources related to the things that I covered in today's talk. I'll share these slides for anybody who's interested. And I want to leave you all with one final Bruce Lee quote. That true observation begins when one is devoid of set patterns and freedom of expression occurs when one is beyond systems. And I hope that this will inspire you to create designs that truly embrace the nature of the web. Thank you.